All right. Well, we did it. The Knicks conquered. They got their uh, big brother moment last night. Let's talk about it. Episode 614 of the podcast. Welcome to BD4. Let's go. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. You are listening to BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA. Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. Let's get to it. Anthony for three. Bang! That one goes down and the game is tied. I'd like to take this chance to apologize to absolutely nobody. The Yankees are champions of baseball. Shaking and baking. Right here on the near oh, fight. Oh, I'm going to close the show. She was doing a great job of free. That is it. It's over. 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 do it it was fun man <clears throat> that was fun last night <clears throat> madison square garden two homegrown kids coming home first game since the trade man and the knicks did it right msg did it right the fans did it right with the ovation um love the tributes you know you could see um manual quickly definitely took it very emotionally um you could see as they showed his tribute, the camera panned to him. He was like, you know, he said he was trying not to cry. And he was closing his eyes, just kind of taking it all in. All in. And R.J. Barrett, man, throwing down that dunk early on. And he showed some emotion. Quickly did the hop, right? The skip. The quickly skip. Um, yeah, man, it was nice. Two good Knicks. Two Knicks who... Helped turn this franchise back around, right? And um, I wish them nothing but the best over there. And, you know, that's it with me. You know, I'm hoping this can kind of be the game where if you're not there yet, this is like, let's move on. You know, we can kind of use this game as like the, um, to close the chapter. You know, it's over. We got a new squad. Let's let's not talk about them too anymore and let them have their success over there, which I think they will. Let's focus on Knicks basketball, man. Because the Knicks picked up a win last night. That was the most important thing. A dominant 126 to 100 win last night at MSG. Quick pace early on in this game. You had Randall and Brunson hot. But at the same time, you could see that RJ and quickly came out with a little something to prove. Toronto goes on this 13-0 run. They go up by pretty decent margin in the first quarter. The Knicks were turning it over. They weren't getting back in transition. Josh Hart comes in with the bench. He provides a huge jolt. He was great. I think he had a double-double or was close. It's 31 all after the first quarter. Second quarter, Dante DiVincenzo's thriving. He's getting inside. He's passing. He's cutting. Playing pick and roll. Randall had a couple of big bas- a couple of big baskets. But the Knicks again still struggling with turnovers. They were still pretty poor in transition defensively. They were leaving the corners wide open. And they went to the half up two points. Third quarter comes. That's when the Knicks kind of just like, all right, remember who we are. We're a number five team. And let's remember who the Raptors are. They are a, even with their new team, you know, a team who's outside looking in, to be nice. So the Knicks went on this 18-4 to run in the third. Randall's whipping passes. Brunson's red hot. The defense and the rebounding was elite. They had some more turnovers. They were still leaving some guys open in the corners. But it was enough to build themselves a 92-78 lead. Entering the fourth, fourth quarter comes. The bench was pretty productive, actually, early on in the fourth. You had Grimes contributing with Precious. Josh Hart keep kept on doing his thing. Brunson puts the game away, of course. 
knocks down a few shots. And the Knicks win 126-100. Brunson with his sixth 30-point game in the last eight games. Randall puts together his first triple-double of the season. A lot of guys played well. Let's see if I can pull up the box score here real quick, see what everybody else did. You had OG Ananobi with 14-7. and seven. Julius had 18, 16, and 10. Dante had 17. Jalen Brunson, 38, 5, and 9. Yeah, he had some good performances, man. I love the offense. Finally, we had a, like a an offensive outburst after the offense has been struggling as we've beaten that dead horse time and time again. You finally break the slump. I guess you could say offensive slump. And I thought the passing was a big part of that. You know, we're seeing a lot more passing lately. And obviously it helps with a more spaced out half court. Obviously that comes with better shooters on the floor. OG Anilobi being the floor spacer in the corners on the wings as opposed to RJ Barrett. There's a big difference there because the defense actually has to respect that. But the moving off the ball, the relocating... And it was the quick decision making, right? And that's that's a big part to their turnover issues of recently. And it was brutal in like the first half, right? Parts of this game, it was just hard to watch, especially in the first quarter. You know, Toronto comes out the gate, they're hedging pick and roll early. They're bringing two guys to blitz up top on ball, and the Knicks struggled with it. Turnovers and just terrible decisions and... As the game progressed, they got better. You, you had Brunson hitting OG one pass over, or Randall's hitting OG in the short pick and roll. The Knicks were doing that a lot last night. They were hitting the short roll, um, kind of as the night went on. You know, bringing up the guards to screen. OG would come up, slip the screen, and the ball handler would, you know, Brunson or Randall most of the time, hit the outlet off the hedge. Just quick, weak side passing. A lot of weak side passing from Brunson and Randall. The driving kick, even if the defense rotated in the back, finding a way to drive and kick. A lot of patience. I love the, the patience that Randall showed on that one play where he hit Dante off the cut. They're both in the middle. Randall's waiting for Dante to cut. Dante cuts in the left lane. Randall hits him under the rim. Beautiful pass. So, yeah, uh, the ball movement's been great, and and the turnovers have become a little bit of a problem because of that. right? The more you pass, the higher volume of turnovers you're going to have. It's just common sense. But it's a little concerning because the Knicks, their transition defense has been pretty poor for most of the season. And... Like, Bream was even getting annoyed with it, too, because there were a number of times where after made baskets, they were still not getting back. So that's an issue we have to keep an eye on. It's something I'm definitely keeping my eye on. But overall, I thought the defense was excellent. Toronto was only held to 100 points. And the Knicks, again, their defense since the trade has been top tier. Top fucking tier. It's been phenomenal. They went from having the 19th Best defense. That's now up to 7th in the NBA. So since the trade, in these, what's it been, 11 games, they have the number one defense since the trade. Which has gotten them from 19 to 7 overall. So they're officially a team with a top 10 defense and offense in basketball. That's a pretty good sign, folks, regarding playoff success. Just going to stop there. Okay, you're hearing a lot of noise about the Knicks in the conference finals. Well, top 10 in both doesn't sound bad to me. Still with trades to make, which we'll talk about. Um, now, early on in this game, the defense was a little shaky. Knicks were... The, the, part of their, their scheme is they help off the corners... And because of that, they were leaving guys like Grady Dick open, Gary Trent Jr. wide open, 
Both of them could shoot, so I didn't love that. But the Knicks rely on luck a lot of the time with their defensive scheme because they help middle, so they leave the corners open. Um, They were trapping pick and roll early on. You saw quickly counter that by finding, you know, the abandoned assignment that was in the trap. The second half, though, they locked down because Tibbs adjusted from a high hedge to a high drop, which is the opposite of a deep drop, where the big's closer to the level, but he's still behind the screen. And I thought that worked to perfection. Whether it was iHeart while he was in there or Precious, who we're going to talk about. Um, But yeah, the second half, you really saw the difference. Toronto was only held to 43 points in the second half on just 35%. I mean, that's a horrendous number. But there were a lot of, just the team defense was great. The communication was excellent. And, of course, there were a lot of great individual efforts defensively. I thought iHeart did a great job when he was in there helping, recovering. Dante was in the pass lanes. He's always in the pass lanes. Part of the OG trade, part of the reason why it's been so successful is getting Dante off the point of attack and back into his off-ball help role. So you're seeing him thrive defensively again. Of course, the Knicks were just killing the glass at a rate I've never seen before. They were 61-31 to 31 last night on the boards. 16-7 to seven in second chance. They were everywhere on the glass. OG Ananobi was great defensively. He was all over the place. He was all, his fingerprints were all over this game. So shout out to OG Ananobi, who was also facing his former team for coming out there last night and doing the damn thing. Coming through massive versus his former team. Now, the numbers aren't flashy. They're never going to be with OG. 14 points, 7 rebounds, a block and three, uh, a steal and 3 blocks. He was probably like a plus 107 last night because that's all he is. But it was his defense that changed the, that made the game so successful for the Knicks. It's his defense that's changed this Knicks season. I did not think it was going to be sustainable for them to rely on dropping 125 points but give up 120 every game like they were doing before he came here with Mitch down. He comes here, and I really believe he saved their season. This kid is an elite defensive wing. He's going to make another all-defensive team. I believe he's already made at least one. Um, he's just so big. He's long. It's just a massive upgrade at wing from having to play an undersized R.J. Barrett there. If I look up, and you're watching the video edit of the podcast, if I look up, it's because I'm trying to watch this Chiefs-Bills game, which has been a very good basketball game. Sans the panning to Taylor Swift every five seconds. Um, thought the defense was great from OG. Great help defense, showing great awareness, right? Covering for his teammates, Randall, iHeart missing a roll, but still being able to not only rotate to that guy, but recover, you know, bringing effective switching on the perimeter. Early in the first quarter, there was a possession where OG was used as the low man. He leaves his assignment to help on the roll, blocks the shot. Early in the second quarter, he had a very similar instance where he leaves the corner to bring rim help recovers to the corner after the pass, and he blocks the three. It's just There was a possession in the second half where he's running in transition. He's behind everybody else, but somehow finds a way to get his hands on the ball and forces a turnover at the basket or something like that. Did an excellent job shutting down the ever-so-annoying Scotty Barnes, who just has the most punchable face in basketball. Shut him down last night. Barnes had nine points. Took 14 shots to get there and missed all three of his threes. He was not good. That's the franchise cornerstone of that of that team. And OG was 0 for 3 from 3. But again, just having him positioned in the corners spaces the floor for everybody else. You're seeing possessions constantly with the Knicks where OG's on the strong side with Brunson but the defense can't help onto Brunson since OG's a corner threat. So Brunson's able to cook a defense in space. Same thing with Randall. So he just commands attention. And I liked all, uh, the offensive display OG was given. Like, he wasn't just catching and shooting. 
The three-pointer wasn't there, so he was going to the basket a lot last night. He got a lot of on-ball reps against his former team. Doing it the same way that we discussed last episode, where he's just like straight line drives and using his body to finish or try and draw, trying to draw contact. But it was working. He's a big dude, and he does a good job of attacking closeouts on the baseline there. I, I got to see, like, I, I know there's, it's like tweeted out after every game, but I want to see where his plus minus as a Nick is up to now because it's got to be still historic. Um, let's praise Precious Achua, who's going to get the second game ball. Excuse me, the second game ball. Um, sorry, I should rephrase that. He's going to get the game ball among the second unit tonight. Bing bang, bing bong. Precious Achua last night, eighteen points, eleven boards, a block, three turnovers. He used nine of ten from the floor. It was a plus fourteen, a plus thirteen. In 25 minutes, he had a nice first half, an even better second half. Some garbage time contributions there, but I loved what I saw from Precious last night. Work in the dunker spot, you know, putbacks, provided a ton of second chance possessions for the Knicks, finishing with dunks and tip-ins and taking advantage of entry passes. You know, he was working pick and roll, a little give and go, 2-5 pick and roll with he and Grimes. A little one five pick and roll with him and Brunson. You know, a couple of actions on the strong side that opened up weak side targets for the Knicks. Just putting the ball on the floor a little bit and then attacking too. You saw some of that. I liked it. The defense was there. Thought the rim protection was solid from Precious. Switching pick and roll. There was a possession where he switched onto RJ Barrett, picked up a nice block on him. That led to a transition opportunity for the Knicks which they scored on. He was all over the glass. And Precious Precious Achoo was important. Try saying that name 10 times fast. He's important, and he might be playing a larger role uh, that we'd like on this team now that iHeart's probably going to be out a few games. Um, I'm hoping that's all it is. I think it was initially listed as a sprained ankle, but I think they upgraded it to a sore ankle. That's a positive. Now, Fred Katz reported earlier today, now today I'm speaking Sunday, January 21st, that we we won't know more on it until tomorrow, Monday, because there's no no practice today. Um, They have the Nets up tomorrow. I'm assuming he's probably going to get that game off. Then you have Denver on Thursday. I don't know if that's going to be the first game you want him playing back. So he might get a couple of games off just because the Games are also spread out. It's going to be a couple days before this next game, this Nets game. You have today and tomorrow off. So he'll probably get a couple games and come back, whoever the Knicks play three games from now. At bet. Hopefully that's that's like the best case, the worst case scenario. Um But yeah, you're gonna probably see Precious a lot more now. Do you see a Precious and Jericho tandem? I worry about this because Tom Thibodeau doesn't employ a switch-heavy defense. And with those two guys, especially Precious, you kind of have to switch for him to be effective. But the thing is, like with everybody else forced into a switch everything, those guys, the Nick guards and wings, haven't been great in a switch everything because they're just not used to it. So I don't know. The Knicks don't switch their fives much and like Precious and Sims their best their best their strengths on defense are their switchability so it's going to be interesting to see how the defense looks I'm assuming he's going to bring Precious to the level or maybe have him play some drop but I don't know and then offensively you, you know the Knicks use Precious like they do Sims, I would say. Screening DHO and they'll have him maybe work. I'm hoping they can actually, because he's got a little bit of a jumper. So maybe he can work the occasional pick and pop. I would like to see Grimes incorporated into those actions for as long as he's a Nick. Him and Precious have worked pick and roll together a number of times already. 
maybe you see, well, I think all Knicks fans have been kind of clamoring for this to happen, but maybe you see a Randall at the small ball five in certain matchups. Tibbs really doesn't like going to it. When he does, it's like for 30 seconds. But like, he's almost forced to now because the Knicks are down two centers. Which is just incredible. I thought the bench unit was great overall, though. The Nick bench was not a problem last night. It was certainly not a problem. Um, 38 points last night from the bench. Shot 57% together. They were a plus one. So, yeah, Precious gave you good minutes. Josh Hart gave you good minutes. You know? It's nice to see that from Josh Hart. 10 points from Hart. Nine rebounds, three of five shooting, two of three from three. And he was a plus 20 to lead the bench. It's nice to see him knocking down some more three-pointers. I wouldn't say some more, but some three-pointers. Though he was still passing up a, a few of them. Um, but he brought energy, right? He brought energy on the glass, defensively in transition, and he kind of changed the direction that this game was headed in the first quarter when he checks in. Without him, Toronto pulls this game away early. There's a good chance. But he checks in with five minutes and change to go in the first quarter. And the Knicks, he, he just, the Knicks run on this run where they, where they ended up going up 11 at some point early in the second. And that was because of Hart. So, um, Randall was with the bench early on last night. The Knicks were down six points when the bench fully checked in with Julius late in the first. But by the beginning of the second, Randall checked out, and it was a tie game. So it actually worked. Um, OG Ananobi's, you know, his minutes worked with the bench, too. He was in his usual spot where he works in the second quarter with that bench. And again, we, we talked about him. His fingerprints were all over the game then. Just two places at once because of his length and his athleticism. I believe there was a Tibbs quote after the game saying something like that. It's absolutely true. The defense, the blocks, fighting through screens, switching, the ball denial. The game was tied up at the top of the second quarter. OG's in with the bench. Starters check in with like a little less than nine minutes left, and the Knicks are up two points. So, again, the guys they threw out there with the second unit last night, they did everything they needed to do, which is just hold it down be serviceable. And because of the bench, because that because the bench was serviceable, you saw the minutes distribution back to normalcy. The rotation minutes were normal. You had three guys on the bench with 20 plus minutes, two of them at least 25. It wasn't the case the other night. Uh, there were no Knicks last night with 40 minutes or more. A couple guys with 35, Brunson was one of them and and um OG was the other. And that was it. Nobody else had that. Um, the only negative off the bench last night is, unfortunately, and I hate to keep nagging on this guy, if that's the right word, Deuce McBride. Right, man? Like, he... <laughs> late in the third quarter. And what what have we've all been saying? Like, I've been saying it here on the show. If you've been following along and listening to these shows, I appreciate it, first of all. You know what I've been saying about it. Deuce is not a point guard. He's an off-ball wing in a point guard's frame. And you saw that early, uh, late third quarter, early fourth quarter last night. Just with sloppy play. The turnovers, right? Forcing tough passes in traffic. Milking the shot clock all the way down and then dribbling it off his leg. Right? That turnover at the end of the third there. Misses a pretty easy shot at the rim in the fourth quarter. He's just not a point guard. His only make was, ironically and in, or unironically, off the ball and, and, and on the wing and catch and shoot. And throughout the game, he was doing a really nice job of moving off the ball. His off ball movement was great, and that's what he does great. You know, he had a moment where he attacked a closeout on the on the, on the empty side and made a nice kick out to Josh Hart in the corner. But for the most part, when the defense closes out at him, 
he has a hard time knocking down shots. You know? I, I just... I just can't see... I, I just I don't want him initiating offense for longer. You know, and, and when he has to initiate, it's just you could see. You could see. When you watch these games, it's just too clunky. It's not smooth. It's just not his role. And he does great at, at when he's in his role. Right? But I am getting nervous because I don't love what I'm hearing regarding getting this bench point guard, combo guard, initiator, whatever you want to call it. Because there's a name that keeps coming up, and it seems like it's 95% likely now, if not higher. And I'm getting very nervous because it's not somebody I prefer. And we're going to talk about that guy when we return from our first break here on BD4. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We appreciate you sticking around and listening so far. When you have a chance, be sure to open YouTube to subscribe, like, and comment. And if you're already watching on YouTube... Be sure to head over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star review. We appreciate your feedback and are always looking to improve. Now, with that all said, let's get you back to the show. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. You're listening to Episode 614 of BD4. The Knicks spoil RJ and Quickly's return. It's becoming more likely each day now that a gentleman who the Knicks saw just last night is going to become a Nick. Um, And this is because the other offers that are out there right now, the other targets, I should say, that are out there right now, the Knicks aren't loving the current price on the market. Regarding DeJounte Murray, it seems like Atlanta wants that unprotected pick in there. I don't know that the Knicks are willing to part with that, so they're waiting there. Regarding Malcolm Brogdon, Begley says that Leon hasn't reached out to Portland. Although there was a report I just read before I hopped on here that the Knicks are reaching out to them, so we'll see where that lands. Um, Regarding Jordan Clarkson, Ainge wants significant assets from the Knicks. That's a shocker, right? That's a very much a shocker. Um, and, you know, I guess, you know, if he's going to take Fournier's contract, he's got the right to, you know, ask for Grimes and an unprotected. But you're also hearing from Begley that, I guess I'll just say the name. I've been dreading saying the actual name. Bruce Brown could become a Nick. That's the name you keep hearing. Begley says it's you've been hearing he's been hearing this name countlessly. And anything Begley says, you gotta take serious because he's a very credible reporter. He's the Knicks guy. And of course, if if you heard Bruce Brown's comments last night, an employee for the Toronto Raptors at the moment, it all but confirms it. <laughs> that he's like like his comments made it seem like he's already worked out a deal or his agent has already worked out a deal with the Knicks. Um, after the game, I think it was. Let me see if I can pull up the comments. So I want to read the quote. Because it was ridiculous. It was like, Jesus, just tell us you're coming to the Knicks already. Um, all right, I'm going to put it on my I'm going to project it to my screen here so I can read it on the notes. The... um. Okay. Bruce Brown, after the game last night, I can do just about whatever Tibbs needs. I play extremely hard, both ends, type of player he likes. Every time we play Tibbs, I go up and shake his hand because of what he's done. Nothing but respect. I love New York. (laughs) Again, I mean, this is from somebody currently with another team if that's not a sign he knows he's going to the Knicks I don't know what is I now this like personally 
just my perspective. I feel like Tibbs's love for intangibles guys is going to harm the team or could harm the team. He's guard he's already got this infatuation with Josh Hart where he's probably playing five more minutes per game than he should be. And I like Hart. But Josh Hart's a conundrum as it is because he's a perimeter player who can kill the spacing in the half court. He's not a creator. And he's not a very efficient, high-volume three-point shooter. Literally, Bruce Brown is a similar type of player. You know, he's a good player. He's, I like Bruce Brown's game, but he's just redundant and unfit to me. Tom Thibodeau loves size, defense, rebounding, physical, drive-and-kick guys, energy guys. And he, lo- he loves them to a fault, in my opinion. All right? And I just, I just don't think it makes any sense. Yes, Bruce Brown is tradable salary for a star player. So there's your asset that you can flip in the summer. But like so many other guys on the trade market are also that. And it's like the Knicks are positioned better than everybody else in terms of capital outside maybe OKC, Utah. So you can't sell to me that Bruce Brown is the best, most fit guy in the market. Because I don't think he is. I, I think he's the opposite of fit. I do. I mean, the, the one fucking thing, the one thing that we've been constantly saying the last three damn weeks, whenever, however long it's been since the trade, is that we lost initiators, playmakers, ball handlers in the Quickly and RJ trade. Bruce Brown's not that. So you're still left with a concern, whether Brunson sits or, God forbid, worse. Does, does the defense look great with Bruce Brown? Sure. You throw Brown alongside Josh Hart, OG and Lobi, Precious Achua. It's a very switchable defense, and it will thrive. Right? But offensively, I, I was listening to, I, I saw a clip, uh, and I thought the KFS guys put it perfectly, Andrew Mosley, saying that there's just too many guys out there, Deuce, Brown, Hart, Precious, if Randall's out there, who cannot or will not shoot. And you're relying on Deuce's tiny sample size as your primary floor spacer if OG's not on the floor. And come playoff time, Deuce is not going to be in the rotation. And then you need you, you still need a point guard. You still need a penetrator. You still need guys who can knock down shots off penetration. Because you throw that lineup out there, all the defense has to do is run a little bit of zone, and you're right back to where you are right this second regarding this bench. Stagnancy, clunkiness, no spacing. Who is running offense with the second unit? Bruce Brown is not running the second unit. It's just feeding into how they lost that Miami series. So the way I'm looking at it is like, if you have to overpay a little bit for a Brogdon or Terry Rozier or a DeJounte Murray, I would do it. Because they were also guys who, one, are also on tradable salaries, so you can flip them in the summer for a big deal. But two, here's what they are that Brown isn't. They actually fit the mold of that secondary playmaker. They can handle, create for themselves, create for others. Shoot. They are much more talented, but they're much more fit. So they can help the Knicks in the short term as well as the long term if they're to be flipped soon. That's why I don't like I don't that's that's why I don't think I sound picky. Like I don't think this is being picky because those guys are actually out there. It's not like Bruce Brown is the only option out there. No, you have guys out there who can help you both short long term. I don't think Bruce Brown is gonna help you move the needle. So if I have to throw Fournier and Grimes and, and a pick for for one of those guys, I'm protected. I, fuck it. Maybe I'm crazy for saying that. But I, I like Brogdon. He can play on and off ball with and without Brunson. Rozier can run pick and roll. He can handle, shoot, pass. 
I don't think Bruce Brown is moving the needle. So I guess it comes down to would you underpay for Bruce Brown or overpay for players who are much better? Because you can flip them too. And then <laughs> I'm seeing reports that uh, this is just going to give me an aneurysm. You're hearing about Alec Burks reuniting with Tibbs. Listen, Burks, good player, serviceable vet. He's a nice dude. He was a fan favorite here. All that stuff. He hit some big shots in the fourth quarter that one season. The dude is a dinosaur. He's a dinosaur who the Knicks tried to overuse as the lead, as the lead playmaker already before. Three what was it three years ago when they were doing point Burks? That was a disaster. So why now? When he's older, when he's a worse player now than the adequate guy he was before. And most importantly, he's on an expiring deal. So he can't be used as an asset. He's not helping you long term unless you do a sign and trade with Alec Burks. But come on, even then, like how much salary are you actually moving? Because under the new CBA, it can't be more than 20% of his $10 million salary that he currently makes. So what are you moving? $12 million? I, like, I'll tell you exactly why Burks is on the Knicks' radar. Because Tom Thibodeau is here. And Tom Thibodeau loves familiar, familiarity. Jesus. Let's try that one more time. Tom Thibodeau loves familiarity. That's another annoying part of him. Everybody's either got to, they all have, have to either fit his mold or have played for him before. Right? Literally, every fucking guy we go after, every guy since the cam situation has to fit Tom Thibodeau's requirements now. Because they went out and got Cam, and he didn't play Cam. That was a whole disaster. Everybody since it has to be a Tibbs guy. I just like, I just feel like Burks and Brown is like very realistic, and that's just gonna drive me fucking nuts. It's it's so clear to me. Maybe I'm missing something, but the spacing is already an issue with Josh Hart playing too many minutes. Why why are you adding? Why are you giving Tom Thibodeau the option to play Bruce Brown and Josh and Josh Hart? Like that's just fucking Christ. I want to end this on a positive because the Knicks are playing great basketball. So we'll do that when we return. We'll hand out our game ball among the starters, and we'll wrap it up after that with a few things. Stay with us. We'll be right back here on BD Four. You can also find us on social media. If you'd like, you can follow BD4 on Facebook, and we're at BD4Pod on both Instagram and Twitter. We appreciate you helping us grow more and more every day. Let's get back to it. If you have time in the day, or maybe just prefer old-fashioned reading over listening, then you can always follow along and subscribe to BD4Blog by going to BD4Blog.com. We're not on there as often, but when we do post, it's just as entertaining, opinionated, and passionate as we are on this podcast. Thank you so much. And let's keep on with the show. All right. Welcome back to the show, episode 614 of the podcast. Great game. Great win. Jalen Brunson gets the game ball among the starters. How wouldn't he? Bing bang. Brunson, another big night. 38 points, 5 boards, 9 assists, a steal. Three turnovers, 57% from the floor, 46% on his threes, 5 of 11. He was 100% at the line last night. He was a plus 22 across 35 minutes. And he's up to 27 points per game on the season. That's awesome. I'm not saying he's better than Carmelo Anthony. He's not better than Carmelo Anthony. But the numbers he's putting up this season are equal to, or not, if not better, than Carmelo's best year as a Nick. Now, you have to put into account that the defense is different today, but also the pace. The pace of the game, the tempo of the game is much faster. And you put Carmelo, a master of scoring, in this modern NBA, he's scoring at least 35 points per game. So, I'm just saying, though. He's having a hell of a year, and I think we're, we're getting closer and closer to making Jalen Brunson not just an all-star, not just an all-NBA player, but possibly in the MVP hunt. That's starting to make some noise. I'm not saying he's going to win it. I don't think he's going to win it. But, like, 
I don't know. Is he fifth on the list? Is he sixth, seventh? That's pretty cool. That's pretty damn good. Jalen Brunson's unbelievable. He gets another game, another game ball last night on the season. He's up to 17 to lead the Knicks. 17 game balls for Jalen Brunson. So good for him. Up next, we have the Nets. So, home away from home. Um, but the Knicks overall, what are they now? 26 and 17, which is still the number five seed. And this month, remember, folks, at the beginning of the month, I said I would love for the Knicks to have an 11 and 5 month. That would be a win of a January for me, given their schedule and like the weak opponents, the home heavy schedule. 11 and 5 would have to be the very least they do for me to be content. So far this month, they're 9 and 2. So they have, let's see, they have to go 2 and 3 the rest of this month to reach that little goal. Pretty damn doable to me. Pretty damn doable. And I have a feeling any one of these days now, we're going to get a resolution on this next trade. Might not be a resolution that I like. Maybe it's one that you like. But if it's Bruce Brown, I just don't see how that's helping the Knicks with their point guard, combo guard issue off the bench. Because he's not that. But we'll see. Excellent win. Hope RJ and Quickly do well with their new squads. Nice to see them last night. Again, nice to see all the ovations and the, the tributes and, you know, RJ uh, coming over to hug, hug Randall. And, you know, it was fun. It was nice. It was an emotional night. I'm actually going to the garden on the 8th of February. And I, I know, I know this, I noticed that the pair of tickets I have, uh, RJ's the, the cover, the promo, <laughs> but I'm excited to go. It, it's Nick's Dallas. So that'll be fun. Maybe Luca will actually play and not dodge the Knicks this time. Let's get to our trivia. All right, so Julius Randle picked up his first triple-double of the season in this game. How many does he have as a New York Knick? Julius Randle picked up his first triple-double of the season in this game. How many does he have as a New York Knick? So let me know the answer wherever you can reach me. If you get the answer correct, I'll give you a shout-out in the next episode in front of all two of our listeners. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you following along, and I appreciate you for staying all the way through to the end of the show if you have, or unless you're one of those TikTok-brained, time-stamped people. Thank you, anyways. Um, that's it for 614. This episode was brought to you by Anchor. Hey there! If you stayed the entire way through, we thank you immensely for it. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and that you come back for the next episode real soon. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, download these episodes, and share them with your friends as well. BD4 is a five-star podcast simply because of you. And we'd like to keep it that way. Have a wonderful day. Go Yankees and go Knicks.